Good evening. You're either watching or listening to Redwood Want. My name is Eric Kirk. I'm with David Frank. We're talking national news of the day. There's a lot going on. We're not going to be able to discuss it all. Um, but I, we want to start by talking about the long-awaited foreign aid bill. Uh, foreign aid was finally passed. Um, kind of a miracle, maybe? I don't know. I mean, it's it was uh, uh, very interesting what happened, a very interesting coalition to pass aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, um, with very interesting opposition coming from the new conservative isolationism, kind of reminiscent of the 30s. Um, I mean, you, you you think in terms of Charles Lindbergh um, opposing aid to Britain in World War I, saying that the Germans can't be defeated. I mean, people, uh, the Freedom Caucus members standing up in Congress saying Russia cannot be defeated and Ukraine does not, sorry, World War II, <laughs> uh, saying you can't, that... Um, that Ukraine uh, cannot be does not deserve the aid for whatever reason, um, and uh, anyway, but the Democrats managed a coalition and and promised to help uh, Speaker Mike Johnson out, um, and it did pass. Um, the the components each passed, and the final bill did pass. Of note, uh, the majority of Republicans voted against aid to Ukraine. Um, but the majorities of both parties did um, support aid to Israel. There was a large progressive opposition, democratic opposition to uh, aid to Israel, but two thirds of the progressive caucus even voted for that. And then there was a mysterious um, right, hard right opposition to aid to Taiwan. I'm not sure what was going on with that. Dave, your thoughts? Um, yeah, so actually I did predict this. This was my prediction last week that yep. uh, so it came through pretty quickly um, in part because of the bipartisan nature of foreign policy, generally speaking, in part because uh, a significant portion of this money uh, ends up going back to U.S. domestic uh, industrial, basically, uh, you know, the military industrial complex, so to speak, which is dispersed throughout many or most congressional districts so there's just a built-in incentive um, plus it's a it's kind of a backdoor way to fund the modernization of some of the weapon systems involved i know that's kind of a technical thing but i just i figured that there's too much momentum um, both domestically and um, internationally i think there was a, a consensus uh, around this kind of new cold war with russia that raised or elevated the uh, the urgency of uh, fully funding or at least getting movement on the Ukraine package, generally speaking. Um, so that, like I said, that combination of interests. And then when you factor in Israel, um, which is, again, broad, broad bipartisan support, and also factor in um, this general, uh, you know, TikTok kind of it's popular right now to be hypercritical of TikTok and, and the Chinese influence in technology, generally speaking. It just seemed like all the forces weren't for a compromise. Uh, I, also, secondarily, they they had tried the, a uni, unified uh, you know package that included um, the border, but it turns out that uh, you know Donald Trump and other Republicans decided that uh, the most uh, you know drastic and uh, you know I don't want to say you know it's it's really the 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 border package that was proposed was was controversial that's kind of the best word i could say uh, that was as far as the democrats would ever go and once that was uh not incorporated into a compromise package then then the then the the, the writing was on the wall that they didn't want to pass it that the, the republicans didn't actually want to pass that reform at this time during an election year, which highlights the fact that it is an election year. Um, so we could get into some of the nitty gritty on this stuff, but just generally speaking, that's why I why I thought it. And maybe maybe I I didn't uh, I didn't say it overtly. I might have skipped over it. But but it, like with Israel being such a uh, front and center issue right now um, for Democratic constituents of the president, um, I'm sure there was a full court press put on. Uh, to make sure that uh, defensive weaponry were fully funded um, in the event of an escalation to a broader regional conflict that we had evidence might break out in the recent you know, week or two. We've seen so much action on that front also. That's right. I mean, 
I, apparently, you know, when when uh, Israel bombed uh, uh, Iran, it was a very token, everybody saying restrained thing. So it doesn't appear that there's going to be an escalation. Apparently, everybody was was you know we, we talked about this last week, and so but unfortunately, more civilians were killed today right after that aid bill comes on, and we see a lot of young. Um, leftists, uh, you know, saying, "Oh, good, we, we've just sent, we're sending billions more um, to to kill even more civilians." And uh, you know, the, the 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 killing is all in Rafa right now. Unfortunately, that's where they are all told to go. So yeah, that's going to be a, a real point of contention because you know, that's that's where even if the money isn't spent there, that's where the perception is going to be. Um, and uh, but I, it is going to make a big difference in Ukraine. They had lost some ground, but they uh, this but they are confirming that they are going to be getting more long range missiles, ammunition they'd been running out of. Now the the ammunition is was like had been ready waiting for this to pass. Uh, they got sixty billion dollars, um, and um, already F-16s are being decommissioned in Denmark. And are going to be sent there and probably be ready to fly as early as this summer, um, possibly July. Some of them. That's supposed to uh, maybe not be a, a huge turning point, but that's supposed to be a, a major change. Um, I, so the Ukraine is is um, apparently this has had a, a morale shift already in Ukraine, um, and then um, in um, in Taiwan. I mean, this uh, this is being seen as somehow China has lost its edge because there's a multilateral assistance backing up Taiwan, where where uh, before there there seemed to be not very much um, support uh, backing to actually back up Taiwan's sovereignty, and it seems to be you know countries uh, a coalition being developed around that. So. This is for in term it was seen as a, a a good backing. Biden is getting all of the accolades from from at least the elite advisors, whether or not he's getting much credit for it politically. Um, and um, and that and and if you watch pundits like um, oh Keeper, uh, what's his name on PBS? Uh, Keeperton is that Jonathan Capehart? Capehart, that's it. Yeah. And Brooks, I mean, they're 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 both praising him. So you know, you've got uh, for his touch on foreign policy. Is that going to get him the votes he needs to win? Well, he's doing pretty well in the polls. So this was a major kind of win uh, for bipartisanship and governorship. So maybe we what, in the time left, we ought to ask, what does this? Uh, mean for um, the Liberty Caucus and and that part of the Republican uh, coalition or, or um, the Republican Party. So there's a couple threads here. Thank you for um, like tacking in this direction. I think that uh, there has been, you know, I guess rumors or, or murmuring about Marjorie Taylor Greene's uh, position that she's kind of prepared the process for for um, vacating the speaker, but has not like executed the process, not not begun the formal process. And I think her public statement was something like um, that. You know, people will be, uh, uh, you know, they'll go back to their constituents, they'll hear from them, and that the there'll be some groundswell of opposition to the bipartisan uh, approach that he's taken here on. On this foreign policy package, um, and so if that does happen, let's just play it out, game it out. Um, they, they, if the Democratic Party stayed on the sidelines, then there would not be um, any doubt that um, at least some people would splinter off um, in that caucus you described, the Freedom Caucus. But the truth is that I think that the in the alignment had to have already um, been. Uh, solidified that the that if if he took this plunge and moved the, these policies through uh, the House, that there would then be um, some backing by the, the um, Democrats will save his butt. The, yeah, save his butt. Exactly that. Uh, so so I suspect that that's what's happened to there, um, or what or will be happening. But then the, but then the question is, well, 
the all the posturing about not just the culture war issues and not just the budgetary issues, but um, you know these specific foreign policy issues, like you said, kind of that America first mantra. Um, how much of it is political electioneering? Uh, leading up to the upcoming, um, you know, election cycle, or, or you know, we're currently in it, but the upcoming election contest, um, and how much of it is sort of authentic uh, principles, and and you know, I think you know you could look to the Senate side, and you could see that about I think it was 18 Republican senators was voted against, you know, the the aid package, and so you could see that there is there still is a a caucus, there still is a, you know, a uh, a reactionary uh, coalition within the Republican Party at, at its right flank. And so, yeah, they'll stick together. Yeah, they'll continue with the well, what I've called team building exercises of grandstanding and and and, you know, I, you know, I don't need to need to judge it. You can judge for yourself what exactly you want to call it, uh, but it's certainly uh, it's 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 uh, political theater at best, probably. And so let, the let, let me put this question to you. Yeah, go for it. Is there a growing we have to govern caucus in the Republican Party that is resigned to the probability that Trump is going to lose and and says maybe we need to go back to the days where we actually have to do something here? Um, so I, I think both parts of that are wrong. I think, number one, they're not actually leading. Uh, that in fact it's really sticking to the script and it's it's uh, it's uh, intended for their own partisan audience only um, that it's not it's it's not um, uh, appealing uh, to people um, across the moderate to you know left side even centrist it's not appealing to a broader coalition so it's not necessarily leadership but also um, do they are they resigned that Trump's going to lose I would say no definitely not um, because I don't think that that anybody can know right now. I mean, it's still so close. Uh, so if you were going to game it out, um, you could have an opinion either way. But uh, but I certainly think it's it's a really close election at this point. So there's I, 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 I think Trump can win, but he can't grow. Biden has to blow it somehow, I think, for him to lose because he can't Trump has maxed out. He can't really gain more votes, I think, at this point. Biden, has, there's a bunch of undecideds, and they're going to break for Biden, I think, if if nothing major changes. Biden has crept back up in the polls to where it's even. He was behind. Um, and I, I just wonder if they're not looking at the calculus there, that if Biden doesn't have some major gaffe or the economy tanks or something really bad happens, that he's on track to to win this. I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm looking yeah. at it. So pundits are starting to say um, because he's um, he's he's marginally ahead in the poll average right now. Um, he wasn't weeks ago. The economy's probably not going to tank. I, I'm just putting that out there though. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that to me that's an unknown, and it's uh, I I wouldn't be comfortable. Uh, speculating about um, any other shoe dropping on the economy right now uh, in, in talking to you know people that this is what they do uh, for a living um, they, they're all pretty skeptical that this is that uh, the economy is as, is as sound and robust and and um, worthy of ad admiration um, than, than the mainstream uh, opinion um, mm -hmm. you know you, you can we, we could look at the actual data and, and say come up with different conclusions but there are, i think there are a lot of people out there that still have the a hangover uh from the, from the uh, inflationary pressures on their budgets right. and um also there's people that are one trick ponies um in, in culture war and one trick ponies in tax cuts and uh and the they their reality kind of bends around those policies despite how thoughtful they might appear on the surface i'm just saying because this uh the people who did this uh, have to figure they're going to take some wrath from the Trumpers for having voted this way. Yeah, so, but if you look at, and I agree with you, um, but if you look at, say, like Liz Cheney's lane and the sort of uh, traditional Republican conservative uh, factions within the Republican Party and maybe even those who vote Republican but are non-aligned, um, people who just consider themselves thoughtful conservatives, um, they, they still, uh, I forget who it was, maybe it was Bill Barr or somebody like that, um, who, who said, you know, I, I 
I would still vote Republican no matter what. And I, I don't I'm not sure if it was it's him, but a few people have come out and then just have said, like, I'm going to vote Republican no matter what, um, no matter all of my criticisms of who the candidates are. So I still think that part um, is is pretty strong. And if you have, uh, you know, look at the judges, for example, um, the, the justices that were appointed by Trump. Um, what would you get if you didn't vote for Trump? You would get the justices that are appointed by Biden. And so for a lot of folks, um, that's that's enough. They don't necessarily need to like Trump at all or any of those, uh, you know, the Freedom Caucus folks. They don't necessarily need to like the people like Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz might be one of the most least popular senators going, but he he might win. He likely will win reelection. Right. So so it's not necessarily about how um uh, your your pro your uh, favorability ratings or charm or uh, appeal curb appeal it could be just some uh, uh, like I said some allegiance to to this to the status quo and I'll add one more thing here I know we're we're almost at the end but um, some people are internationalist in scope and um, so like a lot of Republicans a lot of conservatives they they hear and see and understand the international implications so voting for this aid package like particularly the NATO folks like the Secretary of General came out Secretary General uh, of, of NATO came out and said this makes us all safer supporting Ukraine is not charity it's an investment in our own security so there are there are people out there who kind of can think that second and third level thought about the interconnectivity and uh, interdependence of the world Work very, very hard. Uh, he's a great student. He's very proud of the fact that he did so well. And was looking forward for years to have graduation with his mother and father there. And it looks like the judge isn't going to allow me to escape this scam. It's a scam trial. If you read all of the legal pundits, all of the legal scholars today, there's not one that I see that said this is a case that should be brought or tried. It's a scam. It's a political witch hunt. It continues, it continues forever. And we're not going to be given a fair trial. It's a very, very sad thing. This is about election interference. That's all it's about. Thank you very much. Right. I almost hesitate to even discuss this because I'm tired of hearing about Trump, you know, but but we can't discuss national news, political news, without discussing the Trump trial. It is very important, and it is probably the only one of the criminal trials that is going to happen before the election, so it is important. But I do want to discuss a little bit about the context of the irresponsibility of the media uh, <laughs> around this. I, you know, apparently John... Um, um, Stewart. Stewart did a great piece on it on Monday, and um, you know, and, and there are other comedians and other people are just uh, screaming about how they're talking about um, the way he's the the Trump's behavior in the courtroom, which he hasn't even had a chance to do anything yet. He behaved poorly in the last trial, but all he's doing now is just looking at people and not looking at people and and something about his neck and and um and speculation as to whether he was farting last week i kid you not there was an actual article wondering whether he was farting and um you know whether he's too cold and and uh you know they, they, I, I saw one clip about they were asking a courtroom artist uh were his eyes closed and she said i'm sorry i just couldn't see close enough to know whether they were closed or not you know it was just um, I, that was the best I could do was to how close I was. I mean, and and then they were following his motorcade. I mean, you know, it's just uh, from Trump Tower all the way over. I mean, what, you know, it just um, so it, it was. It, it's ridiculous, and they're getting into details. And last week they were interviewing jurors as they left, and. And they were asking dumb questions, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, really dumb questions. I wanted to know, why were you excluded from the jury? That's kind of important. Or, you know, what was, uh, what were your, your bias? Instead, they were asking him, what did it feel like, you know, to be looking at him? Did he look at you? And I mean, just dumb 
questions. And and it's it's like I, I, there's some important issues to this trial. How many people watching still don't know what the trial is even about? How many <laughs> people actually think that this trial is about um, the that he's on trial for hush money for paying um, you know the porn star hush money people that that that's somehow illegal, right? It's not illegal. Yeah. It's, you you can pay somebody to not talk about having sex with her. This has it is perfectly legal. It has nothing to do. Well, it has something to do with it, but but it's it, but that's not what he's on trial for. And so it's natural for a lot of people to say, why is he on trial for that? The media is doing a poor job of explaining that. So he he is on trial for that. And of course, he's got a name, and I'm you know I'm sure the comedians are talking about it. There was an unfortunate headline that they're laughing about that says Trump stares at Pecker. Well, the the guy's last name is Pecker. He was an editor for um, National Enquirer, and he was part of the what the trial is actually about, which was that there was sort of a a committee put together. The media he did um, what was it, grab and kill or something like that, where their job was to find stories whether they were false or not, buy them and, and silence them. So there was a rumor that, that any rumors of any scam, uh, scandals, he would buy the rights to them and then not have them released. So um, and, and so that was the idea was to prevent scandals against him. And 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 seek and find scandals against Hillary Clinton, and um, you know th this was th it was in this context that this hush money was done. And the problem is, there's nothing illegal about this. But if money is spent towards this end to assist a campaign, it needs to be accounted for uh, by by the Federal Elections Commission in terms of. Of, of election finance, it's perfectly fine to do this stuff, but you're supposed to to um, but you're supposed to account for it, and you're not supposed to spend to to um, defraud, uh, spend uh, submit fraudulent documents to hide the fact that you're spending money on this, and that's what this trial is about. And it's not getting a lot of explanation. We've had one witness so far. That's Mr. Pecker, um, and um, and that that's really it. We haven't had Stormy Daniels yet. That's going to be big drama, and that's worthy of drama. We haven't had Cohen yet, um, who uh, who has actually spent jail on this time. Has the media explained why he was in jail for this? <clears throat> you know, that's that's the essence of the story and that will be a and, and at that point i will want to know what trump how trump is interacting with him and 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 looking at him and how and how they're interacting in court because that will be an important moment but i, I just I, you know I, I, I and so far it's just been it, it reminds me of oj the oj trial how they covered that I, it, which was ridiculous um i i don't think i've seen a another trial with quite so much of this BS in a long time. Dave? Yeah, so you framed this well, I think. Um, and you've, uh, you know, when we proposed this topic for discussion, um, it really was about the media circus because we we talked about the actual kind of uh, legal case last week. Um, but now there's been, you know, a few few developments. But but you know, as critical as I've been about um, so so the right leaning media in terms of its team building and kind of um, uh, how they'll take any given issue and kind of blow it out of proportion and twist it and turn it. I think to a certain extent that's what's happening about this trial. This isn't a particularly interesting trial, but you wouldn't know it from watching regular media because, like you said, they're following every wrinkle or non wrinkle in 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 its minutia. Um, but that said, you know the you you hit on the media criticism elements already, and I do I do agree that I think that, you know John Stewart was was. A, hysterical about it this week but in a good way he was funny like he wasn't histrionic he was he was really funny but um one of the things that came out i think like you you pointed out which i think is more important is that what what was the witness testimony of david pecker and the uh the case when you talk to people like in the street or you know over over a meal on this and you try to say like well the the criminality element is kind of hinging on was this a political uh action was it a was it a catch and kill 
that was a part of a political strategy, a political campaign, was a part of the election process or not? Because if it was just his personal private decision not to have his name dragged through the mud, this is Trump. If he doesn't want to have his name dragged through the mud about his extramarital affairs, that could be considered a private um, action. But mm -hmm. if it's if there is evidence that and, and witnesses speak to that, that, that he's actually said, OK, I'm running for office, but there's going to be people that are going to talk about me. So I need a plan and you guys are the plan. And so so really, that's sort of what the prosecutor, um, you know, that's the case they have to make. Well, the first witness made the case pretty clearly and yeah. said, you know, hey, we met and we and this was our plan and and it was to help the campaign. And I don't necessarily I mean, maybe I'm mistaken, but I don't know if he knows that he made the case so strongly in just describing his own actions as being part of that, because I think that's the persuasion part you have to put to the jury that was this just a private act that's politicized or was it actually you know a deception a fraud was was it what officially those felonies like i think it's you know 41 or something like that um i think that's about or 30 whatever the number is it's in it's, the 30s yeah. yeah over three dozen uh payments of thirty five thousand um, dollars over a course of a you know extended period of time to to uh, fund a catch and kill expenditure related, uh, you know, allegedly related to the campaign. So so that's I think the whole case hinges on, hey, is this is this excessive or is this, um, you know, something that is criminal? And um, and maybe that's why Trump seems so bored because it just, you know, it, it he knows he's in the hot seat and there's nothing he can do about it. And and he can't speak much, and he you know he's kind of like constrained. We talked a little bit about the psychology of Trump um, in this. Uh, plus, he in addition to knowing that is he's not campaigning during this time, and he's not um, basically very free during this time. Um, you know, there's there you go, 34, 34 felony counts in this hush money, uh, 34 payments, uh, or line item alleged uh, uh, felonies for for misrepresenting how that money was spent. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, but but I think that you know that the uh, this first witness, and then I, as you mentioned, Cohen, when he when Michael Cohen testifies, he's a, a, a lawyer, right, by training, and he and and he so and he's a and he's a a witness that's cooperating, so he'll he'll make the case even more strongly, and I think that's when we're going to see Trump really uh, start to twist in the wind, and that's we we may actually see um, more belligerent reactions to divert attention away from this trial because of how close to the, the bone this may hit. Yeah, I, I, and, and this is a criminal trial, so it's actually a little more serious than the last one. The last one was just about money. Um, and so I, I don't know that we're going to see Trump getting up in the middle of some nation and walking out and, and carrying on. I, I mean, there's still issues. He's still, we, we had, there, there's still, he also had a, um, a contempt hearing. Um, the, the prosecution argued that there were 10 violations of the gag order. Um, and, and Trump went outside and claimed that there's never been a gag order before, you know, and, and, um, and that's a violation of his First Amendment rights, that these are people who have attacked him. He should have the right to attack back. I, you know, it, it, again, referring to the judge's daughter, who had had a social media account that she hadn't been on for a year, but whoever had that social media account um, had some sort of uh, uh, a, a, a image of him or something that was not flattering. And so he he made an attack on her, not realizing that she no longer had anything to do with the account. I, I mean, and so they're going to talk about whether or not this was a, a, a violation of, of the order, but his daughter wasn't specified in the list of of uh, people that he wasn't supposed to talk about. Right. It was it, it, he could talk about the judge and he could talk about Bragg, the lead prosecutor, but he's not supposed to talk about junior prosecutors or staff members or court staff or witnesses or um, or jury members. So. Trump apparently was really looking for loopholes in that. And um, so, you know, we're, we're waiting on that. Uh, pr the prosecution at this point was not asking for jail time, but fines. Um, but but still, it's significant. This could happen. Um, so and, and other than that, 
We've just had the opening statements. It does look like Bragg is going for the angle of election fraud. I think that's a little bit of a mistake um, because I guess technically speaking, because he filed fraudulent documents with the FEC, which is the Elections Commission, it's election fraud, but I just don't think that's a word, a phrase that applies. Um, it, it's playing to the emotions, I think, of the jurors, but I don't know. I, you know, it, 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 it I, I'm, maybe it's technically right, and maybe it's not a major part of his argument. Maybe it's something that the media is pulling out because that's what they understand. Um, you know, the, the, the problem is, is I'm not there to hear the whole argument. It might have been one sentence of his and the media makes a big deal about it. And that's what we all hear about. So I, I, you know, would, I would really have to know the context of it. And I only got that one sentence. So it's just, um, I, but, but that, but he really needs to be careful about what he's saying because he's got a million cameras and microphones on him right now. So it's just, um, uh, so they, it, it might've even been said in irony because that's what Trump is saying all the time, right? You know, but sometimes it doesn't translate well. Um, <laughs> but it, it's just, it, it's a, uh, it, this is, it, it's a, you know, from a lawyer perspective, it's an interesting trial. People uh, who, are my, you know, I know friends and family who support Trump say, has anybody ever been charged with this before? It's like charged with, with submitting fraudulent documents to the government. Yeah, I think once or twice it's happened before. I mean, you know, it just, <laughs> It's, um, it, it it is a, it is a thing, and yeah, probably even to the FEC. It's just you know, has anybody been charged with that in conjunction with sleeping with a porn star, trying to hide it from uh, an election, and in this particular situation, I don't know. But I think that it's probably been charged in much less innocuous situations than this. So it's just I, it uh, it's it is an important case, and I you know it it. it Quite frankly, if it had not been charged, I think that it, it would have been the basis of favoritism. Um, you know, this 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 is uh, it's not it's not the most serious crime, but it's not an unserious crime either. It's a it, it's a felony, and it's a it is a serious thing. Um, so you, I, I know we have a limited time left, but um, we talked briefly at one point about the Supreme Court. Um, immunity hearing, right. and it's finally upon us. Uh, Happy that starts tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, it's already here. Um, so we can anticipate that. Uh, you know, briefly, we could we could uh, you know foreshadow it a little bit here. And uh, and I think the fact that they chose to take the case, uh, speaking of favoritism, uh, it, it was a way uh, to delay justice uh, to, through uh, to get us closer to the election. No matter, uh, they could have just sent it back down to the court. You know, ab agreed with the agreed with the appellate court, and and it would have went back to the to a trial court um, to to be adjudicated uh, on a charge by charge basis. Like, oh well, this was a public act. Oh, that's a private act. Was this was this within the the scope of his duties or not within the scope of his duties? But now they're going to take the opportunity to uh, talk about presidential power writ large, and it could be a bigger, longer uh, you know drag on. Uh, the day that he faces uh, stay in court. Okay, that brings us to our final topic, um, protests. Uh, I, I, the protests of, I'm not sure exactly what it's protests, but protests for divestment of Israel on college campuses all across the country. Uh, some of the most famous ones are in, in Columbia, um, but they're at Berkeley, they're in Florida State. 
they're everywhere and they are in Cal Poly. And in fact, Cal Poly has gotten so intense that it's made national news. Uh, local reporter Ryan Hudson actually <coughs> has coverage that is uh, being played all across the country. Um, and and um, the students uh, are the activists are occupying Siemens Hall right now, um, demanding that <coughs> the um, state system divest of investments uh, related to Israel, and they are not say they're not going to give up the building until that happens. Um, police uh, from different agencies attempted to retake the building uh, the other day. I'm not sure exactly what day. Um, <clears throat> and it re they were unable to do that, but not before injuries, some of them some, somewhat serious. I, I saw bleeding heads. Um, the the um, uh, were happened. Um, you can find it on Redheaded Black Belt, Lost Coast Outpost, and um, well, um, Washington Post and and um, Fox News and 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 The Guardian. Um, so um, a, a lot going on. Not sure what the end game is. Um, Columbia and some other universities have d shut down the campus. Um, and are going online. A uh, number of students are demanding the, their tuition for the semester back because of that. That's not what they bargained for. A lot of um, angst are, are around these demonstrations. Uh, Jewish uh, students um, feeling threatened by the occupations. In, fa in fact, um, very conservative rabbi at Columbia is, uh, basically said, uh, encouraged all Jewish students to go home saying that uh, your safety, you're not safe being here um, after some incidents happened. And I, uh, there are a few things that have been caught on camera, including one uh, activists saying go back to Poland to a Jewish student, uh, you know, a, a number of things like that. But, you know, it's um, you've always got a few, um, you know, numbheads in, in, in the crowd doesn't necessarily speak for the whole crowd. I mean, there's, there's always somebody. Um, but do they, do, you know, how widespread is that? It's, uh, you know, you've got a lot of very idealistic people willing to do things. I do want to talk about what what the end game is for these demonstrations, and I you know we we can talk about what they are going to accomplish, but they definitely got attention. They didn't start this week. I actually um, they started uh, last week. They there was uh, they they in, here in California they blocked I eighty um, and for several hours and the the Golden Gate Bridge. Some of them gave up their cars. Um, they parked the cars blocking all of the southbound roads and threw their car their keys over the side into the ocean and um and it took several hours for um, highway patrol to clear that um so you know th this has been ongoing uh and um i do want to say something about the history of protests what's effective what isn't and um and what and and maybe thinking that you, you know i i did a lot of protests in the 1980s and I benefited from the guidance of older protesters from the 1960s um, who basically came to our meetings and said, don't make the mistakes we made. Um, and here's here's some wisdom. And some of us listen to them. Um, and maybe, you know, some of the older activists need to step in and at least try to share some of the wisdom. Maybe we're not doing them a good service here uh, because I see a lot of mistakes being made that um, well, you know, that, that remind me of, of of events that happened in the '60s, um, and I want to talk about that a little bit later. But I want you to chime in, Dave. Yeah, I know I, we've been encouraged to talk about this topic um, from peers and colleagues, friends, and it's a really challenging conversation. But I think now the boiling has kind of, uh, you know, it's reached the outrage has reached a point where it's important for us to comment on this. Um, what's 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 in question before we talk about the protest, I think, is the that outrage about the policy decisions of Israel in their response to the October 7th events, um, yeah. the severity and the impact on the well-being of the Palestinian people. Uh, uh, you know, over 70 percent of Americans, a significant majority of Americans um, have self-reported that they are critical um, and uh, they have these same concerns. That, but the question is, what do you do about it, and and who's who's best placed 
to to impact, uh, you know, to to represent America in this. And when there's a vacuum of leadership at the governmental level in in mirroring or representing that that the questioning um, uh, of these of these choices of Israel and, and and the United States as such a pivotal role that we that we as a country do um, in supporting them with you know defensively um, that 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 makes sense. It's part of the the tradition of uh, civil disobedience. So the question is. Um, People who are engaged in in protest, they get to use the techniques of their choosing, uh, they, but they have to be willing to pay the consequences. So, so now, now what we're talking about is what are those what are those choices and what are those consequences? Because when you hear about the public discourse on you know commenting, uh, observing that protest, um, you know it's it may not necessarily that protest may not necessarily be getting a fair shake. Uh, so, so so much of this is framed. Um, it, uh, around anti-Semitism and freedom of speech, and so we could look at those two those two issues independently. I think we I think it might be best to remember that we are talking about campus protests, and so freedom of speech is really a a, a you know a first order priority. That uh, you know academic discourse, free discourse, the the you know challenging conversations that are uncomfortable are part of the university experience. But the flip side of that is that universities must must act. When that speech um, is, uh, I, I got this quote from from a commentator that uh, when it descends to severe, pervasive, discriminatory conduct that impedes an education benefit, it crosses the threshold into discrimination and harassment. So that's really the rub. Is that what's happening here? And I think you know we can talk about any given person, any given protester, protest location, any university, and they each need to be you know, valued independently on the merits. But I think that we are seeing instead some some conflagration, some combination um, uh, bordering on histrionics about the protesters that take away from the understanding of what's of what's at play. Um, and, and, you know, we, we can unpack this. Uh, but but I do think harm reduction is warranted where necessary, where where it's helpful. Um, for example, Columbia. So that's really the one that rose to the biggest level of attention. Uni Columbia University, in part because their president was in front of a hearing in, in Congress and, yeah. and and getting getting grilled and and taking actions unilaterally that were um, in uh, uh, allegedly in violation of the agreements made between the faculty of Columbia and the and the student uh, Senate of, of Columbia and the, the the you know the 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 rule set that pertains to some of the way that the campus community handles situations like this. She was being reactive to the pressures of, of of Congress. And, you know, like I said, that's a separate issue from what we're actually talking about. But I want to focus one last thing here. Much of what we're seeing on TV at in New York City is outside of the walls of the university. So so there is a, a code of conduct within the walls of the university. And then there's a much uh, uh, <coughs> you know riskier population of people outside the walls of the university who who uh you know even mayor adams said hey that some of these people are professional agitators and so and they are flinging many of these people you've seen the videos probably there is hate speech there is there is assault there is harm yeah. happening in some of these groups and there's no question about some actors but that is not representative i think for the most part university students have been peaceful and they and they have been thoughtful um and and they're not maybe they're not getting quite the fair shake uh, on, on what they're intending to to be the outcome of drawing attention to this really urgent issue of our time. Yeah, I I just say, you know, we don't have a lot of time in these things, but, you know, I just the history of protests is a very um, interesting topic for me. And if I had had time, I would go into the history of the new left, beginning with the protest against the House on American Activities Committee in in uh, the City Hall of San Francisco in 1960, which many historians see, cite as the beginning when they were actually peaceful and they were hosed down the stairs um, of City Hall, led to the Port Huron statement uh, made by a number of, of idealistic you know, young nerds going into the creation of the freedom of the speech movement, um, Mario Savio, Bettina Abtecker, and but as the war raged on and police started to get more aggressive, they were kind of the, the nerds were kind of replaced by the quarterbacks and and cheerleaders uh, like uh, Bill Ayers and Bernadette Dorn, and all of a sudden the teach-ins and uh, and Vietnam Day marches 
were replaced by days of rage and the weathermen and and all of a sudden every, you know the, the it became war zones in, in the demonstrations the these are the stories that were told to us in the 1980s saying you got to have you got to organize these demonstrations with a code of nonviolence you you got to you got to have at least the organizers adhere to them you got to have a way that you talk to the police and talk to people who are not in the de talk to counter demonstrators you got to have a code that you don't vandalize and you got to have a code that you don't initiate violence right and you have an understanding ahead of time and you have people at these things over the years, we've kind of lost track of that, um, and we have not been imparting that on it. And that's not you know, to say that we should go in and wag our fingers at young people. It's just, you know, it's it's that we should just offer this, um, you know, not tone police them, not not tell them that they don't have a right to be angry, and 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 the rest, but to at least offer that uh, this, and also that you need to have realistic goals. You can't just go in and say, divest. When we had, we, under the advice yes, of older adv advocates, professors and the like, we when we were pushing for the divestment of UC system from South Africa, we actually had economics department people put together a program to propose to the union and everything as to how you could divest without losing a lot of money. Right. I mean, it was a, and, and then we had sit ins. We occupied libraries and or, or, or and, and administrative offices. It, it, and so we actually had a, a coherent plan. That's not to fault these students, but you know, they're just saying uh, divest and, and we're going to hold on. It's like, do they even know what divest means? What does it look like? You know, I mean, what what if a, an administrator shows up and says, "Okay, we divested. See, look, you know, um, I, now everybody leave." I mean, how would they know it happened, right? So you you got to have your goals set. I, I'm just saying, you know, there, there's 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 got to be a little more thought put into it. But they don't know it if if they're just students one day and then they're angered because the bombing just goes on and on and on and on and more kids are dying and being bombed and maybe Biden's trying to do something about it but he sure can't see it he's not talking about it and you know and nothing's happening it just goes on and on and on day after day you just get angry and and, and there you are and somebody's doing something and another person does something and and then it happens and here you are and and um i i think it's on us to kind of try to help them out that's just my thought yeah no i think that was really helpful um to to get it out there because it there there are people that that wish they knew what to do and they they they're doing what they can um but but um i, I think there's an interesting light that was shed uh, on this by uh John McWhorter, uh, who's a professor at Columbia, he's he's a prominent uh, opinion writer in in New York Times periodically. Uh, he's like an iconoclast. It's always sort of a like a uh, like an avant-garde, almost right-leaning critique of of uh, of, for example, the left. I'll just say I'll say writ large. I know that's oversimplification. But what he talked about is that um, back when he was in the faculty at Rutgers uh, in the late 80s, when people were protesting South Africa's apartheid government, um, that they really were um, more focused, like you alluded to. So it was a good segue that they they had that you know I I mean I was there at the time and I remember storming. Um, they were storming buildings and and disrupting exams yep. and. And so, so it, it wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, air quotes, peaceful or no. in, com in compliance with all no. the university and, and, standards. And we had our knuckleheads too that yeah. we had to you know, deal with. But yeah. But, so, but he he comments on how like now um, it's it the, the I think he uses the word tenor is a little bit different in part because of uh, you know uh, iPhones and social media. And um, and 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 how that there's just a little bit more grandstanding and a little bit more um, of the uh, ability for people to make themselves like the center of a of a production and and they're a little bit there's a little more um, you know I'm, I'm not going to say I'm not a psychologist obviously but this idea of narcissism this uh, this idea of putting yourself um, in, in the middle of the performance and making your you know making it an event a little bit more about you than it ought to be you know maybe that's a little bit highbrow criticism on his part but um but i think that he he was alluding to the fact that um it this this isn't uh it 
it, it's it's gone a little too far from his perspective at his campus at Columbia. Um, disruptions um, are are um, you know not necessarily um, in in alignment with the the what the university is in, uh, environment ought to be. Um, and, but more so, more than that, um, the abuses that some of the Jewish students there are facing or perceiving that neat neat you know that requires us to be uh, a little bit more critical of of the, the 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 what's happening on the ground so that you just didn't see um back during the protests about south africa so so he's it's a nuanced approach uh that he's trying to make but the idea is that like you said give give protesters a little bit of the of the benefit of the doubt to a certain extent when when it's when it's thoughtful and peaceful and and has clear goals and and it particularly it's trying to raise to light what appears to be apathy uh, from the population at large that seems to actually agree with a lot of what these people are fighting for. Yeah, no, I agree. There need to be workshops, you know, that where there's nonviolence training and there need to be workshops within that nonviolence training about anti-Semitism. You know, some, some of these kids just haven't been exposed to the thinking about it. <laughs> Chili Beanie, the spirits are about to speak. Are they friendly spirits? Friendly? Just listen. All right, this brings us to our last segment, predictions. Dave, what do you have for us? Uh, well, there was the Pennsylvania primary the other night, and um, the one of the squad members, uh, you know, she she won her her uh, her seat, uh, so she'll be representing. Uh, well, at least she'll be competing. Uh, in in that in that uh, competition uh, in come November and, and so she actually fought a tremendous amount of money uh, pushed her way that was trying to marginalize her as being too radical and too extreme and so uh, you know APAC did endorse uh, her opponent and also or at least intended to in the beginning but then they realized how much money she was able to raise uh, and then so now the question is. Will this same fight of trying to raise money against Jamal Bowman of New York and Corey Bush of Missouri um, is that are they potentially going to be pushed out of the box in the primary? And my prediction um, is that it, you know it won't it won't happen that way, and that in fact we'll see that uh, both of these people have a solid base in their communities, and that outside money and influence is not going to be uh, determinative in the primary outcomes for Jamal Bowman and Corey Bush, and they'll both go on to uh, you know, compete in the general election come November. Okay, I'm going to go, go back to the first segment. I do believe that there is a growing um, feeling in among the more sane members of the Republican Party that Trump is going to lose, that they are going to be called on to govern, and that the, that this bipartisan we're seeing, this is why Mike Johnson is is um, hitching on to and ditching his more radical past, that um, that they realize that that the center and that the voters are going to expect them to actually start getting things done. And that that although they don't want to have a border bill passed, that there are elements of the Republican Party that just don't want to have it passed, they've got another problem. The arrests at the border have been declining. At first, they thought they could just say, say give credit to Abbott because of the state policies. But the problem is, is now they're declining in Arizona, New Mexico, and California too, all along the border. Abbott can't take credit for all of them. So they, so they, do they let Biden take credit for it by himself, or do they pass a border bill that they can all, so they can all take credit for it? Um, I, I predict that there is going to be a border bill that is passed. But it's not going to have everything that they could have had if they passed it a few months ago. Uh, so the Republicans are going to have to pass it, pass it now. And because the Ukraine bill has passed, they're not going to get everything they wanted. But there will be one. We'll see if these things happen. Until next time, stay informed and stay engaged. Mm -hmm.